back baby it's world history semester two we're going to be starting off this year with imperialism now i've got a couple of political cartoons here that you can take a peek at and we'll talk about what they mean but let's talk about how we got to imperialism in the first place now remember first semester we talked printing press printing press in europe therefore the printing press led europe to seek out education ahead of everybody because of that education you're then going to have advancements in technology. Those advancements in technology lead to the age of exploration. The age of exploration leads to Europeans discovering new territories where native people already are, but they don't have the weapons and they don't have the ships and they don't have the militaries that the European nations do. So the European nations see this as an opportunity and then they put the opportunity attached to something known as social Darwinism, which we're going to talk about, which makes a country or a culture or a group of citizens feel that they're superior to every other race or culture or nation in the world. And there was no more egregious violator of this than the British and the Dutch. So what you're seeing here are graphic organizers or political cartoons, I should say, and they are talking about what imperialism looked like in this time period. So what you have here, the black and white photo, you have a British soldier standing over all of the continent of Africa. What he's holding in his hand is called the pith helmet, and those were white, and the soldiers of Britain would uh, wear those in very uh, hot climates when their soldiers were there. So you have a British soldier standing over all of the continent of Africa, which would give you a clue as to what that is going to mean. And then you also have the British octopus or the English octopus. And you can see there's a hand on Egypt, there's a hand on India, there's a hand on Canada, there's hands all over the world. And at the height of the British Empire, there was a phrase, there was a saying all throughout Britain, the sun never sets on the British Empire. And what that meant was at a time, they owned so much territory around the globe that wherever the sun was out, Britain owned a piece of it. So let's get into how imperialism started. Now this unit isn't the first time a nation state imperialized other nation states, but it is the time period of imperialism that has the most impact on what the world looks like today. So there has been imperialism obviously before. The Roman Empire expanded all throughout Europe. You had Alexander the Great taking large parts of North Africa and the Middle East and uh, the uh, lower part of Europe as well. You had Genghis Khan who took over so much of Mongolia and China that when he would take over a village, 
every single woman was expected to stand outside of his tent and he was going to have sexual intercourse with them. That's why there's still a large percentage of the population in Mongolia that has a direct descendant line to Genghis Khan. So, imperialism has happened before, but this type of imperialism is when the world takes the shape that is reflected today. Now that doesn't mean all of these territories are still owned by these imperialistic powers, but there's certainly a residual effect. There's a residual effect of a nation state taking over another one and eradicating the populace that already live there. So let's talk about imperialism for this unit. It's the domination by one country of the political, economic, cultural, all kinds of different facets. They take over your country. And Britain's policy was to make the world Britain. Not to come to a compromise, not to hear out the other side. They viewed everybody else as a subclass, as inferior to themselves. They even viewed European nations as inferior to themselves. The British think the French are inferior people during this time period. So when they go into a nation that doesn't speak their language, because they speak the native language where they live, uh, then they view these people as subhuman and it makes it much easier to subjugate them and much easier to dehumanize them and turn them into slaves or to eradicate them in a number of different ways. So imperialism in this particular form, we're mostly gonna be talking about Europe, imperializing the world and we can draw that direct line back to the printing press. Now, like I said, we've seen imperialism before, and I named all those time periods, not all, but I named a few of those time periods. Now the photo you see here, this is of a writer who becomes the British face, or one of the British faces of imperialism in this time period. And Rudyard Kipling has written some things that you're very familiar with. The Jungle Book, which Disney turned into a movie, and a few other things. But the thing from this time period that he's most closely associated with is this concept of white man's burden. Now, white man's burden is born out of social Darwinism. And what Rudyard Kipling and many white, wealthy British men thought during this time period is that they were the superior race to everybody else on planet Earth. And add Britain into it, not only were they superior race, but they were also a superior culture, a superior government, a superior lifestyle, and their concept was, we're gonna go take over the world and make everybody Britain, whether they want to be or not. And Rudyard Kipling d justified it in the concept of white man's burden, which meant it was the white man's burden, specifically British white men, to go around the world and teach the world how to be Britain. Now, did every nation want to be Britain? Of course not. Many nations were doing fine on their own before the British showed up. So, in this time period, Kipling becomes the face of this. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is a test question. This is the big test question right here, and it's the four causes of imperialism. So let's talk about the first one, economic interests. And oftentimes, economic interests are the first motivating concept behind a lot of different things that take place around the world. So the concept was, the more area you own, the more resources you have access to, the more trading and commerce can take place, therefore your nation is going to get the, that abundance of wealth that was taken from that other nation. Now, there are political and military interests as well. Nationalism, which we're gonna talk about, is different than patriotism. Patriotism is uh, loving the country you live in. Nationalism is a concept of loving the country you live in, but then becoming militant to force everybody else to be you, essentially. So, in nationalism, they demanded that their European nations went out and conquered all of the world that wasn't uh, owned by European nation states. So they went around the world, and it was a race to get as much territory as they could, as well as the resources that were on those spots. Now the third one, humanitarian goals. Now that may seem counterintuitive to what we're talking about in a lot of cases, because when the British or the Dutch went in, they fought wars and eradicated populace and did all kinds of uh, horrific things during this time period, but there was also a facet of humanitarian goals. Many felt it was their duty to bring Western medicine or education or the things that could benefit a society rather than the military and flags to plant saying this is ours. So there was a humanitarian effort during this time period as well, oftentimes led by women. Now, social Darwinism, this is something we're gonna talk about throughout the entire second semester here. 
and it is not to be confused with the concept of the uh, strongest traits amongst uh, all of the biological organisms that have been on the earth, are on the earth, or will be on the earth. It's not talking about the survival of the fittest traits. Social Darwinism is a bastardization of that concept that says that people, the strongest people, should eradicate all of the weak people. So this isn't like me getting brown eyes over the course of 500 years because now I live in an area where more sun is out. We're not talking about that. This is a justification for racism. This is a justification for subjugation. And this is a justification for superiority. And when you feel you're a superior race or a superior culture to other people, it's easy to dehumanize the people you're fighting, which meant imperialism ran rampant throughout Europe because all of these European nations felt through social Darwinism that they were superior people to everybody else on the planet. Prior to this imperialistic time period, and there's going to be imperialism all around the globe that we're going to talk about. We're going to start with Afri Africa because of how much the slave trade decimated the continent of Africa. Some cultures cease to exist. We will never know what those cultures are again. Many uh, people that were brought as slaves to other continents or other countries, they didn't know what happened to their cultures, what happened to their people, and they were eradicated from history. Now, because the slave trade decimated the continent of Africa, then you have these European nations playing a game of, to see who can grab the most territory the fastest throughout the continent of Africa. Not just Africa, we're gonna talk about Southeast Asia, the United States, a bunch of different places as we go throughout this unit, but let's start with the continent of Africa. So what nations participated in this? Well, let's go ahead and list them. And there's a very good likelihood that if this nation imperialized an African continent, they still speak that language in that, Afri or in that African country. So for instance, the French, they went into Algeria. So there's a lot of French being spoken in Algeria, which is in North Africa. So you have Belgium, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. And you'll also notice what do they have in common? They all have very good navies. Very good navies are necessary to go and conquer another place. So in South Africa, which became an apartheid state until the early 1990s, think about that, that was caused by the Dutch and the British. And then they essentially took the native populace and they separated them. They didn't get the same access to resources, didn't get the same access to education, water, food, any of it. And they were expected to be separate and violence imprisonment, all kinds of different things were in South Africa, which dates back to the beginning of this imperialistic time period. Okay, so we're just gonna start off real nice and easy to get semester two going. Welcome back to class, everybody. I'll see you next time. Until then, copy box, you know what to do. Let's get it going, play us out. Face.